Hello and welcome to Nikon Report, your weekly roundup of all the latest Nikon news and all other photographic announcements that we found interesting. It's Constantine here. And this is Becky. All right, it's number 91. And again, it's an aftermath of another announcement. Who knows, maybe when this podcast comes out, we're going to have another announcement. Maybe a Snapbridge update. Oh no, it already came out, but you never know. <laughs> okay, so first of all, let's start with the stock updates. We can now fully say that Z9 is available in stock everywhere. What's the waiting time in the UK right now? It's definitely shorter. You're looking at about a week, working week but to 10 days roughly, which is much better news for any of you who have been waiting for the Z9. We have spread the word amongst our people on our waiting list and are now opening up orders to everyone else. So if you're looking for a Z9, then get in touch with us today. That's true. And then just keep that in mind that Z9 is available everywhere right now. Just keep that, that thought because it's going to go throughout the whole podcast when we're going to talk about financials, about potential rumors, etc., etc. Now, the new item on the list that is also available pretty much everywhere nowadays is Z400mm 4.5. One of those cheaper exotics, let's say that. But what's the situation in the UK, Becky? It seems to be that most dealers have it in stock now or they have a limited amount of stock and look like they're getting more deliveries. We're in the process of handling the last couple of our back orders and once those are cleared, then we'll have stock available. So it's all moving in the right direction, if you ask me. Fantastic. Let's move on to some other news. So Nikon updated their lens roadmap um, after they announced 600 mil two weeks ago and 40 mil retro a week ago. And Clearly, they just put those lenses in the list. Nothing has changed, but it's new. It's there for you to download. Maybe prints on the wall as a beautiful poster and hope for the best. Right. Moving on. In the aftermath of the ZFC and 40 mil announcement, we have had several people asking where they'll be able to buy the exclusive black ZFC in multiple different leatherette color finishes. The answer is that it is exclusive to the Nikon store, both in North America, UK, Europe, and in Asia. So no dealers at this time will be getting the black ZFC, sadly. Now, in some regions, there are also color limitations. So you cannot buy, for example, the black ZFC with the red leatherette in North America, from what I'm hearing. Yeah, but everywhere else, if you look at UK, EU and China, you can get your black ZFC, but then you also can add a leatherette on top. So similar to the color scheme that Nikon had with the silver edition. So you can also do that. I personally think that just black looks really nice. And in terms of this, I really wish that whatever Nikon exclusive thing is going on now is going to be lifted at some point. A lot of people pointed out, as well as us, that dealers are concerned about that particular item being exclusive to Nikon store because it's a holiday season and that's the camera that we will sell. And as we discussed in our live stream, which we definitely recommend you, we think that the black version is not exactly as a different leather red version. It's one of those important things. If you're looking at red film cameras launches, they always have them in silver and black. And a lot of photographers do prefer a black version of a silver one. So we assume that that particular version will sell a lot. And in terms of this limiting it, to a Nikon store. First of all, it's concerning for a lot of dealers, but also it's effectively limiting your sales. Indeed. Now, we did have some opinions on the subject and actually brought it up in our live camera chat on Friday. So if you'd like to see what the very lively live chat was like, then you can go and check out our video on YouTube. Uh, it was a good, it's a good hour of talk, not just about the Black ZFC, about lots of different things. But uh, it's always a good afternoon if you, if you haven't caught one before. It's every Friday at 2.15 British time. So you're welcome to join any Friday. All right. Now, let's look at what the future holds. So I think we're kind of done for this year in terms of announcements, but you never know, maybe this Wednesday morning they will announce something, who knows, and I would have to get up at 5 a.m. again, but... Not at all bitter about that, are you? <laughs> no, it's fine, it's fine. I don't need to sleep at all, you know, so that's absolutely fine. I'm a night owl, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. I normally like to work in shadows, personally. Night crawler. Exactly. So in terms of this, there are more rumors popping up about that little camera that a lot of people are waiting for. It's called Z8, and Nikon Rumors has this to share. Nikon Rumors said, I was told that in terms of price and specs, the Nikon Z8 will compete head-to-head -head with the recently announced Sony A7R5. RV, as we call it. At $3,900. 
For your info, here are the basic A7R5 specs. 61 megapixels, AI-based real-time tracking, 8K, la de blah 10 frames per second, etc. The reason that I'm skipping over those is because we discussed this at length on the live stream a couple of weeks back and in our live camera chat. Yeah, it was called what Sony A7RV can tell us about Nikon Z8. So we've discussed a lot of the things there. In my personal opinion, I still would prefer Nikon to choose a different sensor from 61. There is a rumor that Nikon is going to stick to Z9 sensor. And in my opinion, as we mentioned, I prefer a high resolution sensor. Some people prefer a low resolution sensor. So we will see what's going to happen there. Now, the 61 megapixel sensor, in my opinion, has been around for some time now. So I personally would like to see either a new version of this, uh, which would give us maybe a couple of stops of uh, dynamic range or something like this, or maybe even slightly higher resolution. As one of the things that Richie pointed out on the, our talks, mm -hmm. um, he said that diffraction is a problem here. So there's a limited potential of how much we can push the resolution in terms of diffraction. So in terms of this, I think it's a fine balance to maintain. And if Nikon decides to stick to 45 megapixel sensor, well, kudos to them. I would still, in my heart, would prefer slightly, slightly higher than this. Okay. Well, apparently, Nikon rumors were also told that the Z8 camera design is finalized and production ready. And the only issue holding back the announcement is the ongoing part shortage, which we kind of figured anyway. Duh. <laughs> Again, if you look at our live stream with Richie that we had a week ago, he literally said that camera manufacturers don't react on certain announcements, that a lot of the things that's going to be announced, already been announced, been finalized minimum six to 12 months before the actual announcement. So that is not the news to us. And I think it's it's, it's quite easy to predict that the specs that Z8 will have already been finalized somewhere. So, you know, in camera is designed. Now, he mentioned shortage in the article, and that's the reason why I ask you to remember the Z9 situation. So it seems that because now Z9 is on the shelves, they can move on to produce a Z8 camera, or they can now have certain parts, potentially if they use the same parts in both cameras, now they can allocate them towards Z8 production. You never mm. know. Well, continuing on this theme, when is the Z8 announcement expected? The answer is that it could be as early as spring 2023. And that would be my logical guess as well. If you miss this part of the year now, so the next announcement would be anything from January to March next year. Mm -hmm. Now, he mentioned that it could be a CP Plus, which just happens in Japan in February 2023. The most likely scenario is late March, so just before the end of um, financial year, with potential release in May 2023. You never know, as we discussed, we may not see a development announcement. We, it may happen, it may not, but from the past, they only announced cameras like D5, D6, Z9. They didn't announce D850 developments. So in terms of this, we probably will just see an announcement with a release date when it comes. Now, what would we expect from a Z8 apart from those internal specs? What do you think? Well, yeah, Nikon Rumor seems to think that it will have the same form factor as the 6 and 7 cameras. Mm. I hope we're going to have slightly bigger body, more in line with Z9, but without a grip. Again, a lot of people will agree and disagree with me on this one. If you're looking at a 7RV and the other cameras, they all kind of have the same shape. Mm -hmm. I personally think that Nikon doesn't need to compete with this particular. We will have Z7 and Z6 Mark III with these form factors, but Z8, in my opinion, should be aimed at Pro, so therefore slightly bigger form factor would do, just because you then will have a slightly nicer grip and slightly better button layout. You also can make the body a little bit more robust with a better weather ceilings as well. Nice. Now, a couple of other things that Nikon Rumors are stating is that there should be some improved EVF and improved autofocus, as well as having, they think, the same sensor mm -hmm. as the Z9. Fine, they can think what they like. There are also no reliable rumors about a Z6 Mark III or a Z7 Mark III we may have started that rumor <laughs> because I didn't hear anyone talk about it until we started discussing it on the live chat. Actually, on the on the on the podcast months ago, when someone said, "Do you want a Z8?" I said, "No, I'd rather have a Z63 or Z7 Mark III." That was the first I'd ever heard mention of it. Well. That's true, but we also started to hear rumor about full frame ZF as well. So, you know, we love to dream, we Sorry. love to speculate. <laughs> but, you know, what's interesting to me is the Z9, the same sensor as Z9, right? So, 
When we discuss with Richie uh, the flagship cameras, which D5, D6 was, and it was a fantastic camera in low light. It was designed for low light use. Mm -hmm. And then Z9 comes out. Yes. And Z9 was not the same camera. No. It was more of a in line, I would say, D3X in a way, but obviously much faster was focused, much better low light performance, etc. It wasn't really a studio camera, but it was kind of a camera that would do it all, but also aimed at sports mobile photographers. Now, if you look at the sensor of Z6, which is a smaller resolution, it's actually much better in low light. And yeah. I think Z6 Mark II is currently the best low light camera in Nikon's Z lineup. Yes. Now, we obviously have that niche of a smaller resolution body with amazing low light performance and very big buffer for high frame rate. Mm -hmm. So we have that niche. Mm -hmm. So if you release the same sensor on Z8, then it doesn't really answer the same question of low resolution, high low light performance, if you see what I mean. No. So it could be just a smaller Z9 or the AKA D3, D700 thing, which in my opinion is not gonna happen. Now, we also, in my opinion, need to have a studio camera Yes. With a higher resolution, speed is not that important. I mean, I'll take a notes focus, but nothing else. You know, frame rate can be low, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So the same sensor Z9 is kind of puzzling to me because if you release the same sensor Z9, the performance is going to be the same. You're not going to put a new processor in because then you compete with Z9. Yes. You need to make sure that you sell both bodies aimed at different groups of people. It's also, it's not going to answer the low light question. No. Or higher resolution studio question. Yeah. So... I'm not sure if that's the right answer to that. I, I want to see where Nikon goes. If we, if we would go to, let's say, a low res, maybe 33 megapixel sensor, or we would go to 61 or 60 plus megapixel sensor. I think it's a really good observation. I mean, the only other thing that would potentially solve that is if there were a Z6 Mark III, if you see what I mean, for your low light photography. But then it would need... It, you're right. There is nothing in the in the Z lineup so yet answers the D5, D6 scenario. So we we need more cameras. What do you think about this? Um, I'm pretty sure that Z6 III and Z7 Mark III will happen. Eventually. What we'll have, obviously, we had huge discussions about will the Z6 will go up in resolution a little bit. Yeah. Will Z7 stay at 45? Will jump to higher resolution? You never know. But do let us know what you think about Z8. Do you think it's going to be me Z9? Do you think it's going to be a more of a D6 camera? Do you think it's going to be more of a studio camera? Do let us know. But also keep the thought of Z9 technology trickling down to a low body. And we have now finally confirmation from actually President of New Japan that this is the way they're going to go. Stay tuned. Okay, moving on. Yahoo Japan and Weekly Economist Journal Mainichi published an interview with the president of Nikon Japan, Toshikazu Umatate. So we're not going to read Q&As. I've read it for you. So you can't read Japanese. I can clearly. So with the help of Google Translate. So clever. <laughs> exactly. And I put some takeaways from that article, which we can voice and discuss. Great. So the takeaways are Nikon have set their sales revenue of 700 billion yen and an operating profit margin of 10% by the end of their fiscal 2025 year. This is based on their recent financials of uh, second quarter this year, which we're going to discuss right after that. But what they say is that they will primarily come from image and precision manufacturing. So imaging division is huge for Nikon. So mm. keep that in mind. So it's thing that makes cameras and lenses that we all love, you know, <laughs> cool. little thing, you know. <laughs> yeah. But what they also say that the digital market is shrinking and the products like Z9, which is their flagship, and Z30, which is aimed at younger generation and who are into all vlogging and all the social media side of things. So, like us. So they want to push those products. That's what they say. And then video functionality becomes very important. Mm. So keep that in mind. What they also confirm that that 9 tech will shine and trickle down in the newer models. And that's where Z8 comes into place. But I'm sure that Z6 and Z7 Mark III will also see some goodies from Z9. It would be great. The main thing that I really would like to take away from the Z9 is the autofocus system. I think everything else could, yeah. could be different. Not the size and weight? Definitely not the size and weight. Anyway, they've also said while high performance products are key in terms of margin, so sale price has increased by 20% in recent years, in the future, he would like to increase the number of models in a more affordable 
price range, uh, which definitely makes sense for kind of what we call emerging markets and also people getting into the system. Yeah. Having having more accessible cameras, I think, is really important because Nikon have kind of missed out on that in recent yeah, years. Yeah, so is it the range between Z9 and Z30, effectively? <laughs> Basically, but also I think something, if the Z30 is aimed at vloggers, then either bringing that product down in price or making it somehow more affordable, because not everybody can afford a sort of seven or 800 pound camera. Here's the question for you. Do you think we need a Z50 style model, which is cheaper than Z50? So if you have Z30, which is vlogger's camera and it doesn't have EVF, mm. do you think we need to have something above Z30, which has EVF, but not priced as much as Z50 or ZFC? I think that more options down at that bottom end are a good idea, particularly if for Nikon, it's not going to cost them really anything to redesign. They're not reinventing the wheel. They're taking existing specs and putting them in a camera. Do you think we need to have another camera with the same sensor in DX lineup? I'd like to see a new sensor in the DX lineup. I really would. A couple of points to take away from here as well, because um, a lot of people say that there's no point of competing in the lower end products because the margin is so small that you are there really kind of for the brand. But what we need to keep in mind that those things will sell in much higher volumes. And as we've mm. said in the past, those will effectively fund the research and development for the cutting edge technology, such as cameras like Z9 and potential new cameras. Now, from another point of view, there's a Z90 DX lineup that we need to look at. I yeah. think that needs to happen. But again, there are no rumors around it. So it's very difficult to say if you're actually going to see one next year. What we will definitely see next year is Z50 Mark II, in my opinion. Right. And in terms of this, do you think they will bump up the resolution a little bit? Maybe 24, 26 megapixels? It depends what they're trying to make the Z50 Mark II. It depends on what where they're trying to fit it into the, to the lineup. So... The Z30 kind of killed the Z50 in a lot of ways, as did the ZFC. Those two cameras, as we have discussed in video in one of our videos, they sort of cancel out the need for a Z50 in a lot of cases, unless you really don't like the retro design of the ZFC. And mm. honestly, who wouldn't? Because it's a lovely camera. But if the Z50 Mark II were bumped up to be a more premium DX camera and then had a better sensor and perhaps some of the sort of semi-pro features that we might have expected in the Z90, Z90, then we could even do away with the Z90 concept. That's true. And if you look at the sensor that's available right now, we have two prime sensors, 26 megapixel sensor, which is used a lot in Fuji cameras. Mm. And we also now have a 40 megapixel sensor, which is huge high resolution. And yeah. that's, I think, in Fuji X-H2. The question is, do we really need to go to 40 megapixel sensor? Or do you think 26 megapixels is going to be probably high enough for a lot of people? If it's going to be a Z90 sort of camera, then I think that 26 is, is a good point for APS-C because then it's going to just become so noisy and low light if yeah. they go above that, that it will become unusable. So that's that's my opinion. Of course, you may disagree. Other APS-C users might say, no, I definitely want 40 megapixels. But I know for my own uses, I would be happy with the ZFC and the Z50 if they were 26. I don't need more than that. I know for my own users, I don't use DX cameras. But you can't have an opinion. <laughs> that's true. But here's another question about DX for you. Do you think we shouldn't have two cameras in lineup that are literally the same cameras, but have different case styles? Mm. Or do you think it's okay? I think that it was at the time that the ZSC came out, we were questioning why it had exactly the same specs as the Z50. And we were hoping that it would have image stabilization on the sensor or something. The fact that it's got a better autofocus system and hot charging, it wasn't no. really enough to justify the, the bigger price discrepancy. Now the prices are not that much different between no. each other, but it does mean that the Z50 has essentially vanished out of the market a little bit. And it's still a great camera. De definitely don't knock it. It's got built-in flash. You know, there's a lot of things that it can do that um, other cameras can't do, but I don't see the purpose of it in, yeah. in this day and age. I definitely don't want a Z50 Mark II to be effectively a ZFC, so at hot charging yeah. and a slightly better AF system. We, I, we've I, moved past that exactly, point. Exactly, exactly. I think if with that they would come out around the same time, not last week, like Black ZFC, but before <laughs> that, when the original ZFC came out, then we would say, okay, it's a slight update, it's fine, price is the same, fine. But for now, I definitely want to see a little bit more separation. Maybe make Z50 Mark II 
either a sports ca camera, so a KZ90, who knows, maybe mm -hmm. they'll shift it this way, or bump up the resolution, but make it slightly differently, maybe make it better for video work. That's and exactly then, what I was thinking. Exactly. They might go down that route. So you never know. So here are our thoughts on DX. You may agree or disagree, but let's move on to more takeaways from this interview with Toshikazu Mata, who is the president of Nikon Japan. Now, he also added, which I think you'll find very interesting, that single lens reflex cameras will continue to be sold and will not be withdrawn, which is a polar opposite to what some of the other brands out there have been doing recently. Canon primarily, who completely withdrew their DSLR lineup. Nikon are still standing strong with DSLRs, which I think is a very good sign. In fact, we've had emails and communications recently from customers saying they're definitely not getting rid of their D850 and going to continue to use it professionally until it dies. That's true. I think they'll monitor the sales. Mm. And yes, once they start to drop, and they are, of course, shrinking. Yes. So, yeah. Obviously, once they see it's not viable anymore, they may stop. But if you're looking at the goal of 2025, next three years, I think it's quite easy to say that Nikon DSLRs are here to stay. Now, kudos to Pentax, who just released... Uh, a new camera, which is called Pentax KF, and uh, they're sticking with DSLRs. They're not releasing mirrorless cameras. So in terms of this, well, because to them, they do something differently, and uh, my respect to them for doing that. All right, now going from president of Nikon Japan, who talked a lot of financials, mm -hmm. to actual second quarter financials that Nikon published last week. Going to give you a brief rundown. I'm glad you're preparing your coffee. You will need it. <laughs> I'm getting ready. <laughs> yeah. Well, don't worry. I'll, we will try to keep it as simple as possible. We're going to go through the main slides of the presentations and we're going to concentrate on the imaging division. So let's talk about overall results, including all divisions. So overall revenue was 288.3 billion yen, which is up 15.3 billion yen year on year. Operating profit is 24.4 billion yen, which is down 7.7 .7 billion year on year. And imaging products business revenue is 114 billion yen, which is operating profit is 22.2 billion yen. So pretty good. They say that revenue and operation profit grew in all segments except for the precision equipment. So it seems like it's the only one that is losing money at the moment. What do you think? If four divisions out of five is up, up is up, isn't it? Yeah, up is, it, it's good that four out of five divisions are up. I can't remember, honestly, what it was like last year. You know, I don't have a point of reference or comparison. Literally, if, if not only the bunch of slides I put in there that if you look through them, looked. you'll probably f find them there. I'm so sorry. Okay, let's have a look. Well, let's have a look at the imaging division. So compare to last year. The revenue of imaging was up. If you look at the revenue, yeah, so it was 105 last quarter and it's now 114.5 billion. So that's pretty good. Right. Operating profit went up from 18 billion to 22.2% which is quite nice. Now, if you look at the sales units, mm. the compact camera sold 70,000 units. Which shrunk over 130,000 units. Exactly. So the lens sales went down from 660 to 610,000. And then all DSLRs and mirrorless combined went down from 390 to 370. All right. Let's talk about the forecast for the end of the year. So the year ending March 31st, 2023. We've got a couple of things. So they're expecting the revenue to be up by 15 billion yen. They're expecting the market size to grow as parts procurement constraints ease. So parts shortage, basically. Yeah. So effectively, we're starting to see those big cameras and lenses filling the market. So that it seems like they expect to increase their production effectively and supply more cameras. That's right. Now they will continue to focus on profitability and on mid-high-end cameras, tucked in pro and hobbies. Effect effectively, we again talked about those high margins. But at the same time, we saw the president of Nikon Japan talking about the lower cameras and Z30 apparently has been one of those cameras that Nikon is actually is considering to be very important for them. Mm. So it's a kind of a double-edged sword because in their forecast they say this, but then we also have president of Nikon Japan saying that also lower segment market or lower value market is important to them as well. Yeah, then they're also saying that they expect the year-on-year -year revenue growth as sales mainly of mirrorless cameras and interchangeable lenses grow, while overall sales volumes remain flat. So why is it happening? First of all, because of weakness of yen. Right. So your profit goes up because you export more. So why is it important? If your currency is weak, mm. exporting is really great mm. for you because you're making more money. You're making more yen by selling it for the same amount of dollars. Okay. So suddenly your profit goes up, but actually the sales are not increasing. 
Right. I'm so there's a, it's a double edged sword. So we're going up, but effectively, the in terms of units sold, they're not expecting it to increase at all. So we're going to talk about it a little bit later, but keep that in mind. Now, if you look at business segments and major products, so if you look at the imaging product business, they list in Z9 and Z30 is their top camera. So Z30 is very important. Uh, love it or not, it seems like there is a big nick and push behind it. So hopefully it sells well. Now, Nikon still makes lenses and it seems like exotics are important for Nikon. And by looking at the availability of Z400 f4.5, which they have on this slide, it seems that they're trying to make and sell as many as they can. Now, let's look at the sales by region. This is including all segments, but if you look at the United States, they're there 28%, then we have Europe at 16%, but actually, if you look at Japan and China combined, they are at 37%. Again, we talked about it in the past, Sales in Asia are very important for Nikon. Looking at research and development, that didn't change much. So we have 25%, so they're expecting to increase uh, research development to 27%, which may to do with the new products, et cetera, et cetera. But it's been fluctuating up and down several, you know, two, 3% a year to year. So looking at their sales, Nikon projects to sell about 700,000 bodies by the end of the year. So compared to the previous quarter, they dropped from 200,000 units to 170K. So to meet that projection of 700,000, they effectively need to sell 330,000 units in the next two quarters, which is doable because if you look at it, it's about what, 165,000 per quarter. And if you look at the holiday sales, I think the holiday sales is always going to push the units up a little bit. Yeah. And then maybe the last quarter is going to be down because it's after the Christmas. So, you know, normally anything yeah. between January and March is, is a little bit lower. But I think that Nikon will potentially hit that target and we'll be just slightly down on that. And then in terms of lenses, they projected 1,250,000 units. Again, they dropped from 340K in Q2 to 270K. And projection is basically they need to sell 640,000 units in the next two quarters, which is effectively 320 units. It is doable. Again, I expect if Christmas pays off, that will do really well. I really wish that FC and Black would be available everywhere because that would push the figures much higher, in my opinion. Now, as we said, the estimate of 700,000 bodies being sold will stay with Nikon till about 2025. So they don't expect the actually sale units increase year to year. In my opinion, they need to have the bodies, the yes. new bodies to compensate for this. Because if you start to look at Z6 and Z7 sales, actually people now are expecting for the new models to come at some point. So they are now expecting to wait. So we expect that the sales of those models will go a little bit more stagnant and we definitely need a replacement. The same with Z9. Now with Z9 being on the shelves, it's going to stay there. Obviously it's going to sell well, but not in the same union. So we need camera like Z8 to bring those sales up to the same level. I think there is that tricky thing where with the D850, for example, there was a long lead time, not as much in the UK and Europe, but definitely in the USA, it was nine to 12 months before those became a, a sort of free stock, yeah. came into a kind of an in-stock status situation, as they call it. And the D850 didn't really lose its momentum throughout that time. The Z9, I've noticed, started to fall off before it reached an in-stock status. Mm. And I think that's partly because of the amount of need for something else out there. Yeah. And the lack of releases. And it's also $5,500 on pounds camera. that yeah. it's a, f a flagship body, whereas the D850 was half that yeah. price when it first came out. To so. be honest with you, I think Z9 outsold D5 or D6 full stop. I, I want to sure. look up those figures, but I, it's definitely sold to more people than those cameras. And that's maybe to do with that this camera was not just aimed at sports and wildlife after for low light. It's also had the sensor, high resolution sensor to compensate for that. Yes, I think you're right. It also, if you think about it, it was a thousand pounds cheaper than the D6, which was that helps. which was an interesting price choice. And I think that actually Nikon could have made it more expensive. Not that they need to now, but they could have at the outset made it a thousand pounds more and it still would have sold. That's true. Now, they also expect 10% margin generally on their products by 2025. Currently, they had 14.3. They were at 19.4 last quarter. So they dropped 14.3, but it's still above to several courses before, which was a 10.7. But obviously when research development increases and then, you know, with the whole inflation thing and production shortages, et cetera, et cetera, as long as it's above 10%, I think it's a good thing. If you can hit the 20% again, that's even better. I think but it's a long time since we've seen a 20% margin on new camera gear. 
from any brand. 10% is about average. To be honest, I wonder if that also has something to do with why they're pushing their stores so much and why they're making more and more products exclusive is because then they can increase their profit yeah. margin. Here's my theory, and I may be wrong on this, and I want our viewers to tell me that, but I think if you come back to that ZFC exclusive tuning and stores, my theory, and maybe I'm wrong on this one, but I think by limiting that particular product to Nikon store, definitely help them to increase their margin. Yes. Because you get all the margin to yourself, effectively. You don't share it with dealers. Now, my theory is that by doing that, they actually will lower the quantity of units they actually will going to sell. Because right. if the camera would be available everywhere, yeah. it will sell more units just yeah. by, by regular numbers than just it being available in one store. For sure. So if they sold million units, let's say, through the dealers, if they would limit it to Nikon store, they would sell the same million units. I don't think that's, got, that's no, the case. No, I think you're, you're right, because a lot of people, maybe not as much in this day and age, but a lot of people buy based on the relationship that they have with their camera dealer or that because they get their questions answered or because they can go and try things out and try them before they buy. A lot of the camera buying experience used to be revolved entirely around a physical having a physical high street store it's yeah. so less so these days because of online store popularity but i still think that it has a place yeah i also think that uh, when the camera is available from more places so people can just buy you know so maybe maybe some people don't know that nikon store exists yeah that's another thing some people buy the cameras not in your local dealers they go to to be carriers or let's say in Europe they have media mark or targets etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm. so by limiting that camera to your store you effectively limiting the amount of people who can actually visit your website and buy it but if you don't agree with me it's an interesting discussion so do let us know in the comment below and here you have it folks we are now free for three months yay and now for some other news which is not financial Snapbridge 2.9.1 has been released for iOS and Android they have said, and by they, I mean Nikon, they've said, thank you for using SnapBridge. Thank you, Nikon. Thank you. We have improved the app based on user feedback, addressed an issue that resulted in some pictures not being sorted in descending order by date during download. They've made some minor bug fixes. They've improved usability and Google Analytics for Firebase, which in earlier versions was used to help analyze usage data, is not included in the current version. No usage data will be collected, even if you opt to accept data collection. Brilliant stuff. So if you've got one of those iOS devices or Android devices, the download is ready for you. I'm still waiting for my Nokia download. I'm still on 3310. You're still on 3310. So you can play Snake, but you can't download your pictures. Exactly. And now for some third-party news. Capture One Pro 23 has officially been announced, with new features aimed mainly at portrait photographers. Yeah, so if you're a portrait photographer or someone else, there are a couple of features you may be interested in. One of them is smart adjustments, fast culling, layers and styles, change capture time, and variants in albums. Uh, there's a big live stream which is our loan available on Capture One YouTube channel. So do head there for proper breakdown of all the features. That's right. And now for the Grays of Westminster and Nikon owner Christmas event, we officially have a date. It is on the 10th of December at 7 p.m. and will feature the award-winning World Garden professional photographer Andrea Jones. Andrea Jones has photographed gardens and plants professionally for over 25 years. She's won multiple awards for her work from the Garden Media Guild, twice winning Photographer of the Year and also Book Photographer of the Year for The Splendor of the Tree, for which she travelled extensively to capture images of trees from around the globe. It's going to be a fantastic evening. If you're not already a Nikon owner subscriber, then you definitely should be. You can sign up on the website and then you will have discounted tickets. In fact, you get more of a discount than the cost of the subscription for a ticket to the evening's event. So well worth doing for a year. And then you get all the lovely benefits along with it too. So do you think gardens means flowers? Not only, but I'm definitely looking forward to this one. Me too. <laughs> now that you're a flower photographer. All right, let's move on to Weekend Read and Watch. We have a couple of videos for you by us. One is called Z30 versus iPhone. Vlogging with the Z30 for total beginners. Yes, this is the, I wouldn't say definitive guide, but it's definitely a good starter guide for right from the beginning of vlogging all the way up to comparing microphone sound and the footage between an iPhone and a Z30. So it's quite a long video, but 
it's worth a watch. Exactly, because when you're just starting up, there's uh, tons of information and sometimes it becomes a little bit overwhelming. So have a look at this video. We'll give you a good idea where to start and then you can become a YouTube star. That's right. Then we also have this camera might surprise you, Nikon Z9 for video by Abdiax. That's right. It's a great showcase of Z9 video capabilities. Now we also have using tilt shift Nikon lenses on the Nikon Z cameras for architecture photography by Dominique Robert for Nikon Rumors. This is an article that's been posted on Nikon Rumors and essentially explains how you can use tilt shift lenses on your Z cameras for architecture, etc. Let me tell you a secret. It uses an FTZ adapter with F mount tilt and shift lenses. Incredible. And that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us this week. Yes, thank you very much for watching and or listening. Please give us a like and a subscribe if you're on YouTube, a follow, a rating, maybe even a review if you're on a podcast platform. Did you know we're available on all podcast platforms, including Apple Music, Amazon Unlimited and Spotify's of the world? Shocking. And if you'd like to find us on the internet, you can find us on Instagram. I am at Rebecca underscore Danese. The shop is at Nikon and Grace and I'm at Constantine Koshkin. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.